And this pa panel we're going to look at today is something that's been arrived from employee networks or those who take a moment out of their time and volunteer to try and make a change in the world, in the communities, for those they ally with. I think one of the things we've seen in terms of black lives is since George Floyd and how that moment in time and how sad it was impacted the world. It made people use their voice in a way not only to say their own stories but also to say the stories of others, to stand up, to lead, to make change, to understand, to educate. And although we're all on this journey where we know that we need everybody to be involved, today I'm going to look at four great individuals who are also doing this and volunteering their time. And for those who don't know, and I did really introduce myself and what I do, I'm Vanessa Burton. I'm a foundations engineer at Mott McDonald, and I'm also the Advanced and Raising Culture Chair in my network. So I'd like to bring up to the stage Natalie Rose, Jessica Howard, Martin Arumo, and Nick Anderson. Now, my plan was to sit with everyone, but uh, I'm not sure. I really want to see the photographers that I'm here today. So, first and foremost, we'd like to introduce the panel. So, Jessica, can we start with you, please? Uh, yes, now my introduction has to be slightly muted because I do work for the civil service. Um, in what area, I'm not allowed to say. Um, but I am a member of the race network working on events coordination. Um, I work within supplier engagement in my role. Um, and I've been a member of the race network for two years and obviously actively engaging. And I met Jackie, who invited me along to this panel after just a quick conversation on the, uh, <laughs> after a meeting, and she decided that I was right for the panel. So, yeah. And Martin, can you go and Yeah, oh, mate. <laughs> okay. So my name is Martin Miremo. I work for Skanska as a parent company. On HSO project, I work for SES, and uh, I'm lead supply chain manager. Um, I look after the supply chain. Uh, some of you here are my suppliers. We've spoken before, and I'm passionate today to push in the agenda about uh, race and supply chain diversity. And Nick, can you please? Hello everyone, I'm Nicholas Anderson from PSI Global. I don't like public speaking, <laughs> uh, but for this opportunity, uh, I had to put my big boy pants on <laughs> and wear, wear dark, uh, dark trousers. Um, I'm, I'm the rail director for PSI Global. Um, we, we supply the rail markets and the construction markets for blue collar labor all the way through to white collar project management. Um, met Martin a few months ago. We had some conversations and he invited me to, to this day. So hopefully um, I can make an impact. And that's Hi everyone, um, my name is Natalie Rose, I'm Corporate HSE Advisor at HS2, where I've been <clears> for about six years. Um, I've known Jackie for a long time, so thank you Jackie for volunteering me for this panel. Um, I'm also the co-chair of our Race, Ethnicity and Cultural Heritage Network, um, where I'm sure as we go into the questions you'll see why I champion a lot of these things, but it's something that I'm really passionate about. So the first question I'm going to ask is, why have you volunteered alongside your role to be at the forefront of promoting diversity, inclusion, equality and equity? And I'll start with you, Martin. <laughs> yeah, uh, for, for me it's a simple choice. Um, I've always been passionate about anything social. I started my early career working in um, humanitarian sector charities and always worked with people and uh, just got interested to know more about people, their culture, their languages. Um, I've always learned more about people and I thought I can use my role now on this project, uh, influence the journey, the diverse journey in terms of uh, workplace. So I work closely with people like Jackie and Laura at SES. And um, I always feel like I can add more value to the whole project. So this once-in-a-lifetime project whereby 
we can do so much and I have a position of influence so why can't I do something? So that's how I approach it. And to keep you on the toes, Natalie, I'm going to come to you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of baked in to who I am as a person. And now I reflect back, a lot of what Frank was saying earlier actually really resonated with me because now I reflect back on the career moves that I've made and the things that I do when I'm in employment all goes back to who I am as a person, which is really genuinely caring about people and their well-being and making sure they're safe and they're well and they've got everything that they need, which is why, obviously, I'm a safety advisor. Um, but at HS2, I always volunteered myself for lots of different things. I was virtually a champion for everything. So I'm currently a mental health first aider and a health and well-being champion. I was, I was an EDI champion until I was approached um, by the EDI team to be on the reach, what is now the reach network. So I think it's really baked into what I do. So I don't really see it. Um, it does run alongside my day job, but it's also very much intertwined. And um, Jessica? Um, mine's less professional and more a personal realisation for myself when I realised that as a mixed race woman, I was very much in denial about how race affected me and a lot of people for quite a few, for a lot of my childhood and my teen years. And as I became an adult, I realised I, I can't keep acting like this. I have to kind of acknowledge what's going on in the world. And as I had children of my own, I realised that the denial and the, as Frank said, the assimilation I was constantly trying to strive for wasn't the best way to deal with things and it wasn't going to be the productive way to deal with it. So um, I needed to really throw myself into proactively trying to fight against the things that I'd had, I had experienced and that people around me were experiencing. So that's why I joined the Race Network and started being an advocate. And it um, when I look at my position now and I look at the legacy projects we involved, I think it's more important now than ever I can sort of use my influence and, you know, start to talk to people and maybe, you know, we can start looking at things a lot different and we can engage with more diverse communities, you know, which just creates better working environments for everyone and just make little changes that will make a big difference to you know, everyone working in our industry and all our futures. So I feel I've been put in a position, I've had the backing from the people I work with. So, you know, as much as I don't like sitting here and looking at all these faces, you know, it's, I feel this is my calling. And one of the questions I'd like to ask is, can you give an example of the time that you have to speak out <coughs> and ask Nick the question? Hmm. Uh, so, uh, I started in recruitment in 2006. Um, I worked in an accountancy and finance background and uh, a friend of mine got me into recruitment. Um, it looked like an exciting arena. Um, the company I was working for then didn't have a real inclusive attitude to the types of people we employed. You know, we worked in the rail sector, civils, infrastructure, rail airports um, and we predominantly dealt with blue collar labor sort of mid-level site management and you know i was a recruiter people came to us looking for work you'd look at the cv you'd speak to them you'd gauge their experience and i'll put people forward and they would say oh our clients won't like them and i never spoke to the clients you know i, I didn't have any interaction with it. i just started and i would be okay, maybe they know something I don't. But, you know, after a few years, you kind of start to see these patterns of the people they were rejecting, you know, um, and sometimes I would speak up and they'll say, no, 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 the, the clients won't like them. Um, and unfortunately, I used my voice, I used my feet to speak up. I left that company. Uh, in 2013, I had the opportunity to start my own division, you know, as the head and make all the, uh, basically build a team around me. And one thing I said, you know, we, we, I had outreach to the clients, I could speak directly to them and, you know, no one could influence me in who we couldn't put forward. So we looked at everyone for their skill set merit and actually even though some clients may have made certain suggestions we you know we stuck to what we believe was was true and you know uh, to this day i look at some of the things we did early on their opportunities and um the, uh, the 
the people we employed, um, you know, we put a black Muslim woman on a safety critical role, which at my previous company would never have happened, you know, and they, she got on very, very well. I, did, I just remember thinking it, it, it wasn't, maybe some clients thought like that, but it was more what they didn't like, you know, um, and, you know, we took a particular interest in people that didn't have their leg up. You know, they didn't have the money for uh, training or someone that would walk into a room, into the interview room and someone would look at them and thought, no, they just, you know, we really worked hard with those people. And, you know, the legacy is there today. You know, one of them's an engineering uh, driver for Balfour BT operates a tamper train, one's a signaling technician, and they were at the bottom end and they would never have been given an opportunity if I had people above me sort of questioning what I was doing. Um, that's what I'd say. No, thank you very much. And our second question is to all of you. So why do you think that there are some barriers to people speaking out or why people do not wish to speak out? And I'll start with Martin. Yeah, um, just to go back to what Frank said um, about psychological safety, uh, safe spaces. So. Yeah, if you work in an organization where you feel you might not get that cover, you, you will fight. <laughs> you will struggle, you will self sense that you are safe, you will doubt yourself, you will think maybe I don't want to rock the boat, I don't want to cause trouble, so you won't feel confident of going ahead and speaking up. Uh, p particularly the, in the field we work, it's, it's temporary recruitment, zero hour contracts, you know, we've had situations where something is taking place and, you know, our operatives won't, they won't speak out because, you know, if you're on a zero hour contract, you know, you might be on a long, long term project, but if you speak out against your supervisor, your line manager, you know, the following week, your contract has come to an end. So we've, we, we, we find a lot of people as, as Martin said, they don't, they don't want to speak out, rock the boat, because they've got no champion um, um, or someone to, you know, really take that seriously or actually uh, pro protect their, their, their emotion need, emotional needs. And um, I would say a lot of it's down to the power dynamic. Um, when you're looking at the structure of any corporation, especially if like a lot of what we're talking about here is where a lot of senior management and down to middle management will most likely be white people. It usually is. Um, if you are a black person having to, or an Asian person, or anyone having to bring up discrimination, especially against a member of that power structure, who do you go to in the power structure, against the power structure? It's a very complex <coughs> issue to try and, like you said, I said about, um, it's about safe spaces. I wouldn't feel safe going to another senior manager about my senior manager, especially if I am a black woman and they are two white men. So I think a lot of that, and I think people of colour have to be very, very aware of power structures around them. It's something that I think we're taught from a very young age to be aware of um, and how to navigate. And so we almost, to our own detriment sometimes, can, can placate ourselves because we are taught to be afraid of it. We are taught to question and to be careful and to be wary when that power structure isn't working in our favour and we just find ways to be complicit and to kind of go past it, so yeah. Natalie? Um, I agree with everything that everyone has said but I also think it's a fear of becoming stereotyped or becoming a token for your organisation so if you speak out too regularly about something and you become known for the, as the person who champions X, whatever the topic may be, but race in, in this context, then you become that go-to person, which in some, in a, on a positive light can be great for an organisation. They know that there's someone there who is um, championing things in the right way, but then on the flip side of things, you could just be seen as that person that everyone rocks out every time they want to talk about DNI or they want to talk about race. Oh, let's rock Natalie out. She'll be the great person for that. So that that becomes a great fear, and it is a fear of mine, um, which is why I try to um, talk a lot more about the fact that I'm actually a professional safety. I'm a safety professional. I do actually have some qualifications, but I'm also a real champion for equality, diversity, and inclusion, and that 
doesn't have to be two completely separate things, but that can stop people from speaking up. I personally I've got that back from our members when I reach out to them and say, oh, hey, you're a senior leader, and, you know, you just so happen to be a black man, can you come and talk about it? Yes, I'll do it, but don't ask me to do it again because I will then become that person that everyone rocks out all of the time. So I think it's fair there for me. One thing we just throw in there is, do you think trust comes into play? I'll let anyone who wishes to take that. I do. I do think trust comes into play 100% because I am quite lucky in where I work and the team that I work with. They really, really empower me and I trust them. And they trust me if I say something about a particular topic. They will trust that I'm coming from a genuine place. I'm not just throwing a spanner in the works to mess things up. I've also been in spaces where I don't trust my audience. I might have some information that is pertinent to, for example, if I go to another team, some information of things that have been said to me about, to me, by people in their directorate about any, any inequalities or any discomfort that someone might feel. I'm not sure I trust all the time the person I'm speaking to that they will take that in, take the message in the way that it's intended to be given. So I'm more likely to be more open and express myself better within my own team than I might externally. 100% plays a part because that then, if that's linked to your leadership and the decisions that they make based on what you've said, then it just puts you in an awkward position. Completely agree with that one. I think from my own experiences, trust is a key thing we raise as employee networks. We are a critical friend sometimes, and that can be taken as something that can be quite nerve-wracking, especially the first couple of times you do it. You're ready to get your firing letter, and I remember being nervous. And actually, when you're built with that trust of people who will talk to you, challenge you, but also take what you say on board, as a trust builds and builds, you speak out, out and you see more actions being played out. Um, I would ask, do you any advice to someone who wants to speak out? I'm going to give that to Martin. Well, <laughs> so um, my advice would be in this sector, everything we approach it on from risk perspective. So we be it building project, be it myself in supply chain, I approach everything through risk assessment. So I, I, I assess the potential risk. My advice would be um, before maybe you throw your hat in the ring, assess the potential risk because we must acknowledge that the topic is a motive and there's so much unknown. It could go either way. So I think the first step is to recognize that fact and work on the risk uh, factor. Um, if chances are, if you just started that job, zero hour, <laughs> project, uh, what's the likely impact? You might go through the process, yeah, but probably the next week, as uh, Nicola said, you will be out of the job. So we must be honest by us, uh, with ourselves, make the risk assessment. I don't believe in an organization of more than 200 people. You will get people in there who can back you up. We have a new crop of leaders who are inclusive minded, who might back you up. So for me, first, it will be self-assessment uh, before I speak up. And I'll uh, ask myself some questions. What impact will my complaint make? What's the issue? Is that issue really important for me? Is there a pattern? Is there a trend? Is, there, is it a one-off? Is it something that I can fight with? Can I walk away? So I'll make those judgments. Yeah. Uh, um, I've got a very personal experience having uh, doing this of when, when speaking out. And the whole situation spanned out over two years where I didn't speak out for the first instance, but I had to speak out towards the end. So back when, um, in a previous role, back when George Floyd was murdered, um, we were all still in lockdown and things like that. And um, I was still having to go to work. And one of my favorite things to do while doing work was to listen to audio books in my office. So I was listening to the Akala book, uh, Ruins of Empire, and um, working away just on my computer in my office. And another member of staff came in, currently at that same level as me, and uh, did something within the office, 
potted around for a bit and then eventually came back and um, stood next to me and I was typing away and I looked up and I said, yeah, okay, she went, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can I just ask, what are you people trying to get out of all this at the moment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> she said, um, like, just, just not, I could see she thought she'd misstepped, so she went, no, no, just what are you trying to achieve with everything you're doing at the moment? And I said, well, equality, acknowledgement, you know, justice for people like George Floyd. Um, she went, okay. And she went, well, my, my, my husband's an ex-officer and he would never treat anyone differently because of their skin colour. So I nodded along and said, okay, that's, that's fine. And she went, so I just, I just don't think it's everybody. I think it's being blown out of proportion. I went, okay, that is absolutely fine. That's, let's just end it there. And she kind of stormed off out of the office. Fine. We were different people in our nature anyway, so that was fine. Um, about 12 months later, um, opportunities came up to take promotion. And this was in a time in my life where I wasn't really interested in any kind of promotion. So I didn't apply for the three that went. Um, she was promoted above me, which is fine. Um, I still had my line manager who I trusted. Um, we had a great rapport. And then it came to light that we were going to be changing the line manager structure around. And when I got a list of who my next new line manager would be, it was the woman who had made those comments. So. I, had to, I felt I had to speak up at that point. So I went to the next chain command above and said, I'm sorry, I can't have that person as my line manager. It wouldn't be appropriate. Um, I explained why, what had happened in the past. Their first question was, why didn't you complain at the time? I said, well, at the time, I didn't see what benefit it would bring. It was a small interaction. We work on the same level. We have to continue to work on the same level together in an intimate environment. Um, it could, at the time, be put down to just a misunderstanding but when you add a new power structure into it when this person is now directly affecting decisions that affect my career and my life I have to now speak up to something like that because that is an inappropriate um, line for this now to be going into. Long, to cut a long story short um, I was told by a much more senior member of staff that you don't get to choose your line manager and you're blowing it out of proportion. So I know I'll work there. <laughs> so yeah that's Again, like I say, it, it, it comes down to what you're going to gain at the time, what you're going to gain in the future, and sometimes you can learn to just think this is not going to get anywhere and I just now need to be aware, a bit more guarded and maybe a bit more aware of my surroundings than I was a minute before. And then there's times where, no, I have to speak up because this could affect me and it could affect other people because this person is in a position to affect those things. So, yeah. And Natalie? What, would, what advice would I give to someone who wants to speak out? Um, it takes some bravery. It's also really exhausting, depending how, on how hard you want to go. Um, but also, speaking out doesn't have to be sitting on a panel and speaking to large groups of people. Speaking out can also be having a one-to-one -one conversation with someone and bringing them on that journey. So that you, you have to protect yourself so that you're not exhausting yourself. Um, and speak out at the right time where you feel that is appropriate for you. Um, there's been a lot of times that I've spoke out over the past couple of years and it hasn't actually been for me personally, but it's because I've been impacted previously in previous roles where I thought, oh, actually, I've been excluded from that situation and I feel like it's because of my race and I've said nothing, I've just let it slide and I haven't actually realised until I've changed role and I've been able to grow into who I am and bring bringing me like this is the most genuine i've ever been in any any employment that i've ever had um so it made me realize actually i don't want anyone else to not feel empowered to speak out if they need to so speak at the right times i'd say thank you and um, have you noticed any change in the industry since more people are speaking out or additionally to that the belief in allyship and how that plays a role and go to mars from that one yeah, um, I've not seen a lot of changes in terms of um, uh, how construction is structured. We recognize the fact that we are here, the fact that all of us joined hands to set up this uh, day together. It's a recognition that um, everyone is working very hard to improve the situation we are in. Uh, the other thing uh, with the Equality Act 2010, is kind of empowered, um, especially from public sector where we we borrow some good practices uh, in terms of um, uh, procurement, uh, making sure that all those policies to do with the equality in supply chain 
uh, inclusion uh, part of the same ecosystem, ecosystem of contracting. And uh, yes, I can see a lot of changes. Uh, another change that probably I see on the project a lot, we have emergence of inclusive leadership, um, people with that right mindset. I work with them at the moment. I have some of them here, and they'll always back you up and uh, empower you to do more than probably previous years. So they trust you, run with it, and you can do better, much, and you can do that. So I'm seeing a lot of progress. Um, um, yeah, I've noticed the shift, particularly since the murder of George Floyd. There's definitely more of an openness to a conversation about race in general. Um, black and Asian colleagues are wanting to talk a lot more about race within an organisation and bring people on a journey. Um, and there's a bit more of face in the data. So a lot more companies now are collecting EDI data, which is great, collect the data if you want, but do something about it. It can be quite difficult and uncomfortable to face what data tells you about recruitment, about what your workforce looks like from an ethnicity perspective. So I'm definitely seeing there's a lot more openness to that. I'm also finding that staff networks seem to be more powerful, um, particularly in the past two or three years. Um, people are coming there to almost look to committee members or committee or leaders of, of staff networks to be that voice for them where they can't speak. So I'm definitely seeing that cultural shift, but also really importantly, leaders buying into that as well and seeing the impact that staff networks can have on an organisation. Um, I'm definitely seeing more, more leadership from the top. Of course, there could be more and um, there could always be more, um, but I'm definitely feeling that shift. I think in that journey where we talk about fellowship, I look at the young girl taking the GCSEs and going, I don't think engineering might be for you or you're going to fit in. And I look into all the allies have played a role in my life and all the things that I have achieved and still to achieve. Um, and I go back and think, I'm so glad I didn't listen. And that is a power of both allyship and those who help you along the journey, sponsor you, challenge you, put you in situations that sometimes you can be very uncomfortable in that actually led to support. Yeah, and also just to add to that, I think the exploration of allyship is, is great, uh, but we can also be allies to other groups. We, we're not just the victim of all the negative connotations associated with race. We can be allies to other people. We can be allies to other black people. We can be allies to other people with other protected characteristics. So it's great to explore that. And I really like the fact that we, you know, we acknowledge that we do need allies in order to progress, no matter what you do. But that does transfer. Um, you can be a really, really strong ally for someone else, and really, it's just championing, taking that time to have an awareness of what someone is about, and supporting that. That's what allyship is to me. I think you raised a good point there about intersectionality and allyship, mm. and the fact of for whatever box the world seems to put you into, or you have to tick. Actually, it's also asking people to support you, but supporting others. And I think that's a good point we raised there. So we're all a support to one another to build that equal, inclusive, equitable society. And what do you think are some of the next steps that need to be tackled in the industry? And this question to all of you. So to mix it up, start with Nick. Um, when I look at the industry now compared to when I started in 2000, so, 2006, so many amazing things are happen, happening. Um, you know, we all champions of EDI and, you know, even, even from a boots on the ground perspective, you see some of the stuff the clients are doing, the communities they're getting engaged in. Um, but I still see this, um, you know, when you look at management level and you know frank when you're talking about c-suite level it's the opportunities aren't they're, they're not quite transferring and you know it might take a, a very very long time but also you know i've spoken with martin many times and you know in in an african culture you know when you talk to people about construction it's like you haven't made it you know they just see you know a, a man digging a shovel and they just think that you you know you need to be a doctor you need to be a lawyer you need you know you need to make it and i think when we talk about the next level particularly with how powerful social media is now 
construction it's bigger than just you know a person digging uh, on the side of the road you know there's wonderful careers in IT and procurement in in you know in 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 a whole host of things so I think we really need to sort of push that and engage where you know where you know people have got the phones and they're looking at stuff and you know we need to engage where um, you know they're looking and grab their attention and also you know show them that the, these things are happening, you know, you are actually protected in this industry because, uh, you know, for a lot of people, you still got this view of a construction site and, you know, you imagine football factories and, you know, this very rough macho image and it, it's, it's changed, it's significant. But if you ask a lot of people, you know, that's probably what they think. So um, I think uh, that's, if we look at the social media element and attracting people, and let them know it's a safe space and we will back you and we will champion you and you can have a prosperous career. I think that's, those are some steps we need to look at. Um, Jessica? Um, I think one of the steps that needs to be taken or just acknowledged really is the, um, the correlation between class and race. So when we're talking about senior manager etc why black people aren't necessarily making it to that level or Asian people, anyone, any person of colour, making it to those more senior levels, it's it, have opening that conversation of how class is now playing a part here as well and what those barriers are because because once we open those dialogues and those conversations which i think are almost as equally hard to have a dialogue to have then we can start addressing how we combat and how we break down those barriers to get past that next step as i think we've, we're making good headway currently in a lot of areas but i think that next barrier just has it's a multi-pronged lock i think that needs just a bit of extra attention Martin. Yeah, um, I'll start by probably just adding on to what uh, Nick said. Um, a, a few months ago, I advertised for supply chain apprentice job and uh, got about 10, 12 CVs. Most of them were minority candidates and all of them were asking, were asking questions, wanting to know of construction. What is it all about? Yeah. And that tells you there's a lot of work needs to be done. So I know Nick uh, spoke about the use of social media, but let's even stop there. Today, select any top five construction company, go to their web pages, go to their career page. You will see the career projected there or the photos is all the typical construction jobs. Yeah, someone driving a dig and what have you. Which we are in construction, we know that's our bread and butter. Why can't we project the other hidden side? So for example, at SCS we have a logistics center and we do amazing <coughs> stuff in IT. Why can't that be projected? Yeah, so that's one. Second is about um, the use of uh, we have a good network like what you are leading, Jackie and Natalie, race network. But for me, I'm thinking we'll still achieve what we want, but going forward, it might take us 5, 10, 20 years, but we'll achieve it. But I think we should also target the quick wins, and for me, probably biased, <laughs> but passionate. I'm so passionate about supply chain diversity. And uh, Frank, probably from U.S. experience, can tell us how that has transformed the community in the U.S. And I've been working with uh, Jackie on the sideline to figure out how supply chain diversity can impact the whole ecosystem of um, inclusion. Yeah. And um, Natalie, um, I would say. Um, echoing a couple of your points actually but going a little bit further back investing in showcasing what the construction industry has to really young children as young as possible i was just telling a story this morning about when i was at primary school i can still quite vividly remember the firemen coming in and speaking about putting fires out if you want to be a fireman do xxx and it wasn't until I got to about so 11 or 12 when I left primary school and I thought, oh, I remember when the fireman came, but I can't be a fireman because I'm not a man. That's just, it just in me, I, I didn't realise that until much later. But 
I know that we go out as HS2 as a business and speak to schools. So we want to go out and really connect personally with schools because children really do remember those conversations that you have with them from an early age. And you're planting the seed for a nice tree to grow later on in life. So if we want to see that things are changing, of course, invest in the now and what and our supply chain now, but also think about the supply chain for the future. And, you know, you hear it so many times, you can't be what you can't see. So if people aren't seeing you as young as possible, then they're not going to aspire to be you later on in life. So that's for me. I think um, that was one of our last questions. I think it's hopefully you've got some key takeaways, not just sat there listening that we can take back to industry. I think it's important to remember my key takeaway is that it takes everyone to make this change. And the journey that I've had and is the advanced racing culture and community. Actually, it forms a network of our EDI team, exec sponsors, my managers, HR recruitment, companies coming together. My two goals when I started back um, five years ago was to get in a uh, race pay gap and to have a session where everyone came together in the industry and each year it didn't quite happen and today it has. And I think that's an applause for where we go to in terms of those long term goals and those short term wins and how once we come together we can truly make a change. So without further ado, I'm going to go to questions, and I hope you have them, otherwise I'll be right How many do you want, Jeff? Um, I'd like three questions, please. And then you can all have some coffee. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I love you. you. <laughs> no pressure. Bring, bring them on. <laughs> bring them on. Yeah. Right, should be my books bouncing out. Uh, great subject, really important subject, and... Uh, but you know, you need to appreciate that every instance and every individual is a different scenario before we start uh, speaking out. Martin, I love the, the reference to your risk assessment before you say anything, and that really resonates with me. And uh, the question for me really is, we work in really hierarchical organisations, and I've had people who come to speak to me and say, look, oh, I'm too scared to speak out. It's okay for you, you're a director in Stanska, but I can't do it. You know, so what can we do around the hierarchical situation? Because in the four organisations to become more diverse, more inclusive, we just need to start changing that. Does anyone want to take this question? I think remortgage and hire Frank. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my answer. <laughs> I think, I, I, for me personally, if I'm thinking about what I'd like to see at HS2, it's seeing more executive members having those really difficult conversations. So if that means that our, not even necessarily our HR director, another director, our health and safety director, having those conversations visibly or inviting or being part of any incident investigations, whether that be from a HR or safety perspective, and then eventually that trickling down. I'm all for things being baked in. I use that, that, that phrase quite a lot because I'm from a safety background. I feel that everyone should bake safety into what they do. And they should also bake equality, diversity and inclusion into everything that they do. But it will always start at the top. So if, if that means for the next year, our executive team members, gosh, they'll kill me for saying this, our executive leaders will be part of every conversation about race or every investigation that concerns race for that to trickle down then so be it action the data's there don't speak about it be about it um, just to your question i think one of the things you've implemented at once is to speak out when people can raise some confidential so even though you should always go to hr you can and it gets tackled through and sent to the right person so communications will be sent out to everyone and I think that's been a powerful tool where actually now we're seeing more people now speak out normally because trust is being made there. Uh, one more question. Yeah. All right, yeah, sleeping might be too. Um, I think it's an observation rather than a question, but I'm happy if the panel want to come back. Um, so, a personal experience um, a few years ago, I might say, where it was, who I was working for at the time. But uh, I think it links back a little bit to, to Frank's point about. Um, drawing in the number and focusing on the number. Um, I'm quite senior executive, middle-aged man, crying, a bit like myself, you can ask me. Um, back then, um, made a statement in a team meeting. The next senior leader I hire will be a woman. 
And if we can address the race gap at the same time, even better. Now, I didn't call it out in that meeting in front of eight other colleagues, but I did call it out in a one to one with that individual. Because for me, that undermined the purpose of what we should be trying to achieve. Because I think Natalie said it earlier about tokenism. If you just focus on let's get another percentage on the dashboard to say we've achieved it, I think we're undermining the purpose. And that's just a personal reflection of a conversation I had a few years ago. I think it's really important to have those conversations. So, Steve, for you to later call someone out and discuss that, it's really, really important because nothing will ever change. It may well be that that conversation that you had would result in someone never even saying that again. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, really important that we try to avoid. Although I earlier said, you know, it's really important to gather the data and it really is important so that you can see a picture. The action that you take based on the data should not just be so you can only get the quick wins. You should be thinking further and not thinking about how you can tick a data box, how you can change culture within the organisation. And that's a lot more difficult than achieving a percentage. Um, so businesses should take a time to really think about what needs to be done to achieve a better culture in an organisation. And a lot of people don't like to have that difficult conversation. It's in the too difficult box. We need to open the too difficult box because there's lots of stuff in it. I think Natalie raised a good point. When you say someone gets a job because they're a woman of colour of their skin, you're slightly implying that you don't think I'm good enough to get that job anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing to raise is that we always think about meritocracy. People are out there, they are brilliant. They do something with a passion. And therefore, it's for us to find them, not to tick a box or to undermine someone to say that they're only there for whatever box you can put somebody in. Um, is there any? I think I'm not going to do more questions, just conscious of time, we can bring it back. However, the last thing I'd like to say is on today, you can see on the wall there's some coloured um, sticky notes. And what we're asking today is everyone can make a pledge and everyone to write down an action. And we will take a picture. So mind when you guys come of something you wish to do, you don't have to do it now, but we'll end on the breaks and by the end of the day we hope to see it filled. Thank you so much to the panellists for the discussions. I hope you've had something to take away and I hope you enjoy the event and go get some coffee.